Have you ever wondered what Poshmark's opinion is about bots? Or have you ever wondered out of the 70 million users that they quote, how many of them are actually active on the platform? Well, we have the answers to those questions. Poshmark filed a couple days ago with the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, to become a public company. Part of this filing is submitting a prospectus. The prospectus covers a bunch of information. It talks about how the company makes money, what their financial position has looked like the last few years, how the executives are compensated, how the shares will be distributed, and what types of shares will be available. Um, it talks about the key risks of the company. So I have read through Poshmark's prospectus. It is about 200 pages long. I will link it in the description down below if you want to read the whole thing. After reading through the prospectus, there are eight key items that I pulled out that I'm going to talk about in today's video. So first, let's talk about inactive users. If you guys have watched my channel, you know that this is something that really bothers me. Poshmark has a lot of inactive users. So it could be someone who downloaded the app three years ago, maybe used it for a month, never has gone on the app since, doesn't check their notifications. So someone goes and buys something from this user and the user never responds to them, they never ship the item. And this creates bad experience after bad experience for buyers and it just gets worse over time. So I've always wanted to know how many users on the app are actually active and how many are inactive. In the prospectus, we get exact numbers. So right towards the beginning of the prospectus, they have a page where they list some key facts about the company. On this page, they say that they have 70 million total users. And in the footnote, they specify that this is cumulative since inception. Also, later in the memo, they say that they that approximately one in five people in the U.S. have joined Poshmark. This is based on the 70 million number since there's about 350 million people living in the U.S. These are the two pieces of information that I have heard Poshmark quote before. But now let's get into the juice the information that I really care about. How many people are actually active? It says, as of September 30th, 2020, we had 31.7 million active users. And it defines active users as users who have logged into our marketplace in the trailing 12 months preceding the measurement date. So from September 30th, 2019 to September 30th, 2020, there were 31.7 million people who logged into the app. They had 6.2 million active buyers. Active buyers are users who have purchased at least one item in the marketplace in the trailing 12 months preceding the measurement date, regardless of returns and cancelizations. And they have had 4.5 million active sellers who are users who have listed an item on the marketplace in the trailing 12 months preceding the measurement date. So of the 70 million number, only 32 million have logged in, in the last year, so about half. And of those, only 6.2 million have purchased something in the last year and 4.5 million have sold something. So that is the information I wanted to know. So it's not 70 million that are on the app actively buying and selling. It's four to six million who are buying and actively selling. It's good to know. And I think it is much more transparent than the 70 million number. For comparison, I did look up eBay's active buyers. They say on their investors relations website that they have 183 million active buyers. In their 10K from 2019, they say they have 180 million active buyers, but it specifies that these are from transactions both on StubHub and on eBay Marketplace. So it isn't a clear comparison because it is mixing in StubHub as well, but it still shows you 6 million compared to 183 million. Even if you take out StubHub, there's a huge difference in the size of these two platforms. So next, I'm just going to quickly list off some fast facts that you might find interesting that I don't really have much more to elaborate on. So first, Poshmark was originally incorporated as Gosh Posh and then later changed their name to Poshmark. Second, 83% of active users are female and 80% are Gen Z or millennials. This doesn't really surprise me. That's right about what I expected, but it's still interesting to see the exact numbers. Next, the most followed seller on Poshmark has 2.7 million followers. The average order value in 2019 was $33. And on average in 2019, 290,000 items were listed daily. Next, let's talk about Poshmark's profitability. In the prospectus, they talk a lot about the details of their financial statements. And I'm gonna specifically point out their net loss chart. So as you can see in this chart, in 2018, they ended the year at a net loss of negative 14.5 million. In 2019, they ended the year at negative 48.7 million. And in the lower chart, you can see that in Q2 of 2020 was the first year that they actually ran at a gain instead of a loss of 21.1 million. In Q3 2020, they were again positive. 
So there are a couple key things I want to know about this chart. First of all, it is not uncommon for companies to IPO when they have not been profitable or only have recently become profitable. So it really isn't that odd for them to be IPOing despite always posting losses until the last two quarters. Second of all, I think it's important to note their marketing expense. It says marketing expenses represented 60% and 65% of revenue in 2018 and 2019 respectively. We significantly reduced our investment in marketing to 17% of revenue in the second quarter of 2020, while growing revenue 41% year over year for the same period due to the continued benefits from the network effects of our social platform. So in 2018, they spent 60% of revenue on marketing. In 2019, they spent 65%. And then in Q2 of 2020, when they experienced the gain, they dropped their marketing expense from 65% of revenue to 17% of revenue. In another section where they're talking about marketing, they say marketing expense decreased 30.5 million for the nine months ended September 30th, 2020, compared to the same period in 2019. The de decrease was primarily due to 31.5 million decrease in spending on marketing programs, including decreased spending on television ad campaigns and digital marketing to preserve liquidity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So a couple interesting things here. First of all, I think there were a lot of people asking at the beginning of the year, are the ads cut down? Because I'm not seeing ads as much. This tells us yes, in 2020, they cut the ads that they were showing. And th they also say here that they did this to preserve liquidity during COVID-19. So what they mean by that is they wanted more cash on hand, likely because of the uncertainty as to what was going to happen to the business given COVID-19. I just want to point that out because the two are happening at the same time. They're cutting their marketing expense, but they're also getting a large gain at that time. So within the prospectus, they have to talk about what are the key risks that an investor should know about the company. And as part of talking about these risks, they often talk about actual incidents that have happened related to the risk that they're listing. So there are two specific instances that they talk about that I never knew had happened. So I thought you all might also find this interesting. So for example, it says that in 2017, there were hackers that actually got into the systems and got user information and took money from different users' accounts. Poshmark was able to reimburse all these users, but it's interesting because I hadn't actually heard that that had happened. It also says that in January of 2019, Google suspended Poshmark's listings from showing in the Google search which I never knew happened. And if some people saw a big drop in sales, it might have been because your listings weren't showing in the Google search any longer. So next, let's talk about executive compensation. All public companies are required to disclose the total compensation that their C-suite employees make. And in the prospectus, we get to see Poshmark's CEO, CFO, and COO's total compensation. In 2019, Poshmark's CEO Manish made $3.6 million in total compensation and the CFO and COO made just under $1 million. Now, the company I work for, it's a Fortune 500 company, we also disclose executives compensation and they make about three times as much as this. So for me, this didn't really surprise me that much, but I'm guessing for some of you, you might be a little bit shocked by how much the executives make. So let's get into another juicy topic, bots. Within Poshmark's prospectus, they specifically talk about bots twice. So if you aren't familiar, in the context of Poshmark, bots are generally referred to when talking about automated computer programs that will share your Poshmark listings. Within the community, there's a lot of debate about bots. There's people on one side that say bots are against Poshmark's terms of service. They can just take down your closet or penalize you if they find out that you're using bots. You should not use them. It's not ethical and it's not allowed. And then there are people on the other side of the argument that say Poshmark doesn't do anything about it. And if I have a bot that saves me a ton of time and then I can invest that time other, way, other ways in my business and make money in other ways. And then I've seen people who used to be on this side that were against bots, but as they saw their competition or the other people who are running similar businesses start to make more and more money by using bots, then they slowly became convinced that maybe it's worth it because there is no penalty at this time and there's a lot to gain by using bots. So let's talk about what the prospectus says about bots. In the key risks, it says one of the key risks is our continued growth depends on attracting new users and converting users into active buyers and sellers. Then in the discussion of that risk, it says, if we are not able to address user concerns regarding the safety and security of our platform, 
If we are unable to successfully prevent abusive or other hostile behavior on our platform, or if we fail to address the use of programs or other forms of automation to participate on our platform, the size of our user base and user engagement may also decline. For example, the use of such programs, commonly referred to as bots, to artificially inflate the popularity of users or their goods, including through liking, sharing, and follow following, or the perception that these programs are being used could diminish the user experience on our platform. Although such programs are prohibited by our terms of service or TOS, a small number of users have nonetheless made use of them in the past and may continue to do so in the future. Under these circumstances, we may have difficulty attracting and engaging users and converting them into active buyers or sellers without incurring additional marketing expense. And then in the discussion of another risk, they cite bots as something that can increase that risk. So clearly this is at the forefront of Poshmark's minds. They put this in their prospectus that bots are something that they're worried about that are a risk to the company. So I guess all I have to say there is don't be shocked if something happens in the future where they actually have some kind of penalty if they can tell that you're using a bot. Before I get to the last two topics of the video, I just wanted to ask if you could please give the video a thumbs up if you are finding it interesting. Also, if you are not subscribed to my channel, please consider subscribing. I make content that's mostly about Poshmark, although I'm starting to add in some eBay content and I'm known to be very analytical. Although I do have a couple more fun videos on my channel. For example, I have a series where I buy packages from different people on Poshmark and then I open them so that you guys can see how a bunch of different people package their items. Okay, now let's get back to the last two topics. In the prospectus, Poshmark talks a little bit about their shipping agreement with USPS. Ideally, I would want a little bit more information than what I found in the prospectus, but I'll tell you what it says and what I think it could potentially mean, but I do want to say that I still would want more details to really understand what this is saying. So on, in one part of the prospectus, it says, our agreement with the USPS is scheduled to expire in March 2023. In another section where they're talking about revenue, it says the buyer also pays a shipping label fee as part of their order. On some orders, the shipping label fee exceeds our shipping label cost, which we record as revenue. In 2019, this revenue was 1% of our total net revenue and was less than 1% in 2018. For the nine months ended September 30th, 2020, this revenue was 3% of our total net revenue. Our revenue is recognized when we satisfy our performance obligations. So for the nine months ended September 30th, 2020, they made 193 million in net revenue. So if you take the 193 million and multiply that by 3%, you get 5.8 million, meaning they made 5.8 million revenue because of a difference between the fee they charge for shipping and the actual cost they paid USPS. For the final topic of today's video, I wanted to talk about the Poshmark Directed Share Program as I'm sure many of you have gotten an email about this program. What it is, is Poshmark has designated a certain portion of the shares, up to 5% of total shares, to be made available for sale at the initial offer price to people who meet the following criteria. They currently reside in the United States. They have made at least one sale on Poshmark between January 1st, 2020 and December 2nd, 2020. They have opted into the Posh Ambassador Program on or before December 2nd, 2020 and four, they are not current or former employees of Poshmark. So before I go any further, I just want to say, you guys, you know how many times I hear people say, being a Poshmark ambassador doesn't even get you anything. Here's something that we're actually tangibly getting as a benefit due to being a Poshmark ambassador. So this FAQ says that all eligible Posh ambassadors will receive a standard email on December 18th, 2020. That is not true because I'm eligible I didn't receive an email yesterday. I was trying to figure out why. I was talking to a lot of other people who meet these requirements who also didn't receive an email. And what we found out is that the consistent thing was whether or not you had email announcements turned on on the app. And if you had them turned off, you didn't get the email. If you had them turned on, you got the email. <laughs> so I didn't receive it yesterday, but they seem to correct things. Today is December 19th. And all the people I was talking to yesterday who didn't get it, we all got it today. So that statement isn't accurate, it didn't come on December 18th, but I have gotten it now on December 19th. If you're interested in more details about the Directed Share program, I will put the FAQ in the link below. It is publicly available, not just to the people who are eligible. The main idea is that it allows people who meet those criteria I just said 
to buy Poshmark stock at the initial offering price, which hasn't yet been announced. The main restriction is that you have to buy a minimum of $300 worth of stock and there may be a cap if too many people are interested. I'm not gonna give any advice on this because there are a lot of factors and it's really up to you to decide what you want to do. Let me know in the comments down below, if you read this prospectus, what else jumped out at you that I didn't talk about? Of the topics I covered, what did you find most interesting or what surprised you? If you enjoyed this video, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and stay tuned because as always, I'll have a new video out soon.